Hi, everybody. Welcome to this new episode of the Real Talk with Rick podcast. The guest on this episode is our current sta- uh, Eden Prairie State Senator, Steve Swadzinski. Steve, in the state legislature, represents about 90% of Eden Prairie, but he's also known, has been known for a long time, as a high school government teacher at the Eden Prairie High School for over 30 years. So in this episode, I had a chance to talk with Swad, as he's known, about his uh, teaching career, what led him to the state legislature, and some of his thoughts in his first two years in the legislature. You will also hear in this podcast that the there was a time when Swad was a four-letter word that you didn't necessarily utter and what the consequences for that were. So here is my conversation with SWAD. Senator, thanks for coming in here. My pleasure. This is going to be the highlight of my day. Wow, nothing else has happened today? Um, I was at the high school today for a couple hours talking to some government students, which I... I just love being at the high school talking to those kids. God, it's just... And I call them kids, and they're like seniors in high school. Half of them are probably 18, and they can vote and be served in the military, and I still call them kids. Anyway, so I was at the high school today, so that's it's hard to beat spending a couple hours in front of high school students. Well, you know what? You started in a great place because I introduced you as, as our state senator representing Eden Prairie, but everybody knows you as SWAD, SWAD fr- from the high school. So that's very fitting, and maybe... Kind of under this um, podcast of of you, we I'd like to kind of take us f- how you got to Eden Prairie High School to be a teacher there for for thirty three years. What what brought you there? Um, well, first of all, I my first couple years I was a little uptight. You know, I had to prove myself as an educator. You know, because I was young and I grew a big beard, so I'd look older when I went ordered school lunch and and um, so. Kids would call me SWAT because all the staff called me SWAT. And so uh, I'd put kids in restricted study for calling me SWAT. And so because, you know, I considered, um, you know, it's not professional. I'm the, you know, you're supposed to Mr. Swadzinski with in professionalism. And so I put kids in restricted study and after school detention for calling me SWAT. And finally, one day, I'm marching a kid down to the um, detention for calling me SWAT. And he goes, where are we going? And I said, I'm putting you in detention. You don't call me SWAT. It's disrespectful. And he goes, everybody calls you SWAT because we love you. And I stopped (laughs) and I paused and I said, okay, you're good to go. <laughs> Ever since then, I let every kid call me SWAD. Did anyone call you SWAD before you started teaching? So um, my mom um, and dad got married in 1958, and things didn't work out. So my mom needed a place to live, and things being what they were for a single 19-year-old um, woman person in 1958, she moved back home with her mom and dad. And so they raised me, the three of them, till I was 12 years old. And so I was born David Keene. Uh, and then when my mom moved back in with my grandparents, I became Steve Lebo. And then my mom got married when I was 12 years old. And is, so my name was Steve Lebo. And when she got married, he was Steve, or, you know, Charles Swadzinski. And so my name became Steve Swadzinski. And no one could pronounce it. None of my friends. So they said, we're just going to call you SWAT. SWAT. So that started when I was 12 years old. And so... You know, life in Superior was good. A small town at that time period. Um, it was great. Middle class life and everything was wonderful. And then when I was um, about 18 years old, I decided um, I, uh, I lost the use of um, my uh, – I couldn't walk for 51 weeks to the day I was on crutches. I was in a wheelchair and a coma and crutches. And so 51 weeks without putting weight on my left leg. Wow. Yeah. And so – And when you were 18? Um, I was 17, 17? 18, so that wow. year, that count, that um, that can't, year, year, and um, it was a, it was a car accident. It was a bad deal, and um, and so when I could finally walk again, I fled um, Superior, Wisconsin, and 
hitchhiked to the first big city in the way, which happened to be Minneapolis. And I moved downtown and um, got a place uh, uh, right on 15th and LaSalle, downtown Minneapolis, and tried to make ends meet and got a job at the Lemington Hotel for anybody in the audience over the age of 90. Uh, so I worked at the Lemington Hotel, and it was great, great time, great lifestyle, great era in, in Minneapolis, and started meeting some new friends, and um, so that's how I ended up down here. And yeah, that would have been sometime in the mid-70s then? Mid 1979, and there was this 70s. huge group of people from Superior, all like graduates from of high school from, say, 74 through like 79. There just happened to be this gravitational pull towards Minneapolis because everything was dying up there. The mines were dying, the ore docks, the grain elevators, down Main Street. Everything was just dying. There were no jobs whatsoever. So we all came down here, and then we all met, and that's how I ended up meeting my, my first wife. We're yeah. still married but you know you good your first, wife, yeah, your first wife yeah yeah it's a way to you keep yet them. to have your second yeah, wife yeah, yeah, well yeah. you know the wisconsin so i'm from wisconsin yeah i know well. i'm from wisconsin as well i'm from the eastern side of wisconsin you're from you know northern wisconsin you know iron range near duluth and i graduated in the late 80s in wisconsin and there are many of my friends from high school that are in the minneapolis area mm. so i think this is a draw from from the area so i could understand that but you just kind of crossed the border and hitchhiked i, I didn't hitchhike here I didn't do that. Well, um, uh, well, I didn't that, that have can a be unsafe. car. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Mate. Well. You know. But it worked out for you. It was a sense of adventure. Yeah. 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 So you went to the U. I um, first I worked at the Lemington Hotel and um, I moved down here and I originally got a room at the YMCA. I'm probably the only person you'll ever meet that lived at the YMCA where the village people were singing about how much fun they were having at the YMCA and no one I knew living at the YMCA was having fun because it was the lowest you could possibly go at that time was to say, where do you live? At the YMCA. So, uh but then I got a job, and, and at that time, you could. it took me seven years to get my bachelor's degree at the U, just because at that time, you couldn't really afford to go to school full-time, but it was cheap enough where you could go part-time and work part and full-time, and just it was just a nice time period when you could pull that off. You can't do that today, and that's why I was on the seven-year plan. Well, the seven-year plan was probably much more affordable than the seven-year plan would be today. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then you make it to Eden Prairie High School, or was that your first teaching job? Um, so I I met a woman also from Superior, and um, I, we were at a wedding in Superior, um, and a bunch of people from Minneapolis that met and fell in love with each other, and one of them ended up falling in love with another anyway so the wedding happened to be in superior so we went i went up to there to this wedding and there was only like five kids there and everybody else was like in their 30s and 40s and 50s and so there were about five of us sitting around and one of them happened to be this patty go lot and it was pouring rain and she just told me about buying these brand new shoes so i carried her out to her car and it, it was pretty cool and um i don't know maybe a year or two later um i I asked her to marry me on the um, um, the um, the steps of the Chicago Art Institute, and it's four days of sweat pouring down my brow and off the tip of my nose. How do you ask somebody to marry them? And I didn't have anybody I could ask, older brothers or a dad. Anyways, it was just so. Finally, after four days of agony and perplexion, and how do you ask somebody to marry them? And I agonized over oh, romantic dinners and art institute paintings and sunsets and nothing was striking me and so we're after four days thanksgiving weekend because i wanted to give thanks to my wife and sure. or my girlfriend and give to her for the rest of my life and that's what i wanted to do and we're walking out to chicago art institute and i'm heading back to minneapolis and the whole point of going to chicago was to ask her to marry me and i still hadn't done it and i got like 20 minutes i got my backpack on and i said let's get a, a photograph of the two of us remember in those days you set your camera on the ledge and hit the timer and so she's standing under the lion um, in front of the Chicago Art Institute. And I set the timer. I ran into the camera. I got down on my knees and I said, will you marry me? And the camera went click. <laughs> and so that's the photograph we have hanging up in my in our home is the me proposing to my wife on the steps of the Chicago Art Institute. So she said yes. And shortly thereafter, I was fortunate enough to get hired in um, Eden Prairie, Minnesota, where I had the best 31-year career any man could ask for, any person could ask for. That's great. Well, and, and she's still your first wife. She is. So it worked she is. out. Yes. It worked out. 
as of t- this moment. Still your first wife. Yeah. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, yeah, Eden Prairie High School, tell me some of some of your uh, favorite moments. Oh, God. What um, are some of your fa- highlights? I, I, you have uh, four days. How long is this? Pot? Four hours, ten hours. Well, you can you talk know, for ten the, hours. One of the minute. highlights is clearly um, Bush coming to the high school. I okay. got so much material for that. I mean, I ended up with an 86-minute lesson just from his visit to the high school. All the stories and anecdotes and all this. Um, Paul Wellstone, I had a fight over me introducing him, and it became a very famous Eden Prairie story of his of Bush's visit to the high school. And, and so that... Well, that, I don't know. T- can you tell that really quick? I don't know if everyone oh, knows man. that. Um, so, well, so the... So... The night Bush is coming on Monday, and the night before, the media was interviewing me because you know this teacher is introducing the leader of the, in my eyes, the leader of the free world, and um, so I I was on the local media networks on Sunday night, and my phone started ringing off the hook. My rabbi who bar mitzvahed me, who I haven't talked to since my bar mitzvah, um, called me up that night, (laughs) and so. I, there was a phone. It was great. It was a great night. People I haven't probably talked to since were calling me up. Well, anyways, about ten fifteen, Patty, I'm going to bed. Tomorrow's the biggest day of my life. I don't. I, I can't. I can't keep doing answering phone calls. And she, so don't don't wake me up. So I go to bed. Ten minutes later, she walks in with the phone. Um, the phone, right? Yeah. 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 I mean, today, you know. The yeah. phone. Anyways, she walks in with the phone. She goes, "Take this call." And I said, "You know, I, I told you I'm in bed. No, I don't want." <laughs> she goes, "Take this call." So I pick. Phone comes to my ear, and um, right away, this guy goes, um, "So I, this is Paul." And my head's going through the roller decks of Pauls that I know. And he goes, "It's um, Senator Wellstone." And I go, "Oh my God, hi!" And he goes, "Are you introducing President Bush tomorrow?" And I go, well, yeah. And he goes, how dare you? Do you know what he's doing to public education? Do you have any idea how he's going to be destroying public education? I can't believe you. Why are you doing this? And so he's kind of yelling at me on the phone. And and so finally, I just said, well, he's the leader of the free world. I'm a government teacher. This is an opportunity of a life. And he goes, well, is it a policy stop or a party stop? And I go, what? (laughs) And he goes, and he yells louder. Is it a party stop or a policy stop? And I go, Senator, yelling it louder won't help me understand the answer. <laughs> and he cracked up, and then I knew it was maybe better that he was at least laughing. And he explains to me the difference between a policy stop and a party stop. And, and it, it's controversial, and what um, the visit was to the high school. And finally, I just said, Senator, I'm, I'm going to be introducing him tomorrow. It's a, and he hung up on me. And so and it was really disturbing. I couldn't fall back to sleep. I'd known Wellstone for about 20 years at this point, sure. off and on through things that we our paths would cross. And So, okay, I take um, 40 kids to Washington, D.C. So that was um, March 4th, um, 2002, right after 9-11. That April, I take 40 students to Washington, D.C. Wellstone's visit's always great. Wellstone wrestles me to the ground he's playful with me he's just great he's great with the kids and it's just a great hour of the trip to dc this year he doesn't show up Uh sends an aide and um Uh i'm like okay this is not Uh good so finally after the aide does a little presentation with the kids and um she go i go okay can we i go see wellstone's office and she goes oh yeah we can go see his office so we go to his office and he's in there and he sees me and he goes like this and i take all the kids in there and i'm not kidding there's a photo of this somewhere in the World Wide Web that one of the kids took. He's got his fingers in his face, and he's shaking at me. I can't believe you introduced him. Do you have any idea how ashamed I was of you? You are no longer – and he's just yelling Still at me. Still upset. Still upset. Still upset. Month and two months later, finally turns to the students and he goes, Do you guys have any questions? And um, they're all like, no, we just want to get out of here. Why are you yelling at our teacher? <laughs> and so, okay, now it's um, – so I call Patty that night. And she goes, you go down there and apologize. He's upset with you. You got to go down there and apologize. And I'm like, yeah, okay, go, I'll, I'll call. I'll cancel every, all your appointments. Swad wants to talk to you. And, and she goes, you know, he'd do it for you. And I said, no. So anyways, now it's the state fair. I'm going to go with my kids. They were like 8 and 12 at the time. And we're going to go meet Wellstone to meet your senator at the state fair day for Wellstone. So we're waiting in line, waiting in line. And um, and finally, I'm going to apologize. I'm trying to figure out how I can apologize to him because I, I disappointed him, somebody I idolized. And so finally, he sees me in front of the couple in, in front of us, and he pushes them out of the way and comes up to me and gives me a great big bear hug, lifting me off the ground and says, I apologize. Sometimes, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, sometimes my 
my convictions get in the way of my common sense. And if I had been a government teacher, I would have seized that opportunity too. So anyways, that was State Fair. October 30th, my phone rings. Maybe one, the only time in my entire teaching career, Patty called me at work. Phone rings in my classroom. I pick it up. She's crying. And I, I, I go, what's going on? She goes, you don't know. And I go, what? She goes, Wellstone's dead. The and the, yeah, and yeah. the first thing she said is, can you imagine if you two had never made up? Wow. And that's wow. the story I used to tell in class is it don't – I mean, it, life happens. You, we all fight with our loved ones. But to, to if him and I had never made up and all of a sudden he died in that plane crash, I'd carry that with me to the day yeah. I die. So, you know, I tell the kids that don't be the last thing when you leave the house, slam the door, mad at your parents because your mom could get hit by a drunk driver, your dad could die in a plane crash. And if that's the last time you interact with them, um, you'll haunt you till the day you die. So that was one of the things I tried to do all my years of teaching is – that's a so great anyways, story. Yeah, no, that's a great story. A no, it's long. a good story. And, and students, I mean, that's a huge part. Yeah. Oh. I mean, in fact, you know, as a teacher, didn't, you taught long enough where well, didn't you have parents and grandparents say you're teaching my kids and my grandkids? Yeah, I mean, and isn't great that long... grandparents. Yeah, yeah. No. All right. Um, maybe not great grandparents. I had but... um, maybe about a half dozen um, ex uh, students that I ended up having their kids and. Um, one had a picture. Um, one year before I started taking kids to Washington D.C., the choir trip would go to D.C. and they all made "Hi, Mr. Swadzinski" letters. So each kid held H I C, "Hi, Mr. Swadzinski" from the steps of the Capitol. So uh, this kid was in the photograph that was up on my wall that these kids made for me. And uh, 25 years later, this kid comes up after class one day and goes, "See that girl there?" And I go, "Yeah, that's my mom." <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So, did make you feel older. It I mean, did. So no, that's why we don't. We're no, moving on to the next oh, question. Okay. Uh, yeah, anything else from? Because uh, we're going to work our way up to uh, running for office. But anything else that jumps you out know, to you from those I days think, as a teacher? Um, maybe. God, I. Uh, there are so many stories that my ki that became part of my curriculum just because they're teachable moments. And so one. Um, I'll tell this in two minutes. One day, um, I get this note in my – yeah, right. The, uh, no, it's all good. It's yeah, all good. The We're interviewer good. just rolled his no, eyes. Like, I can not. tell anything in two minutes. We, well, that's true. That's yeah. tough. So this – I get a note in my P.O. box at that time, no emails, and it says, we'd like to meet with you after school about this young man's eye problem. And I'm like, God, I got to go to the after school to tell this kid to put your eyeglasses on, and girls will still you know, think you're cute and you'll – so I walk in, and all of a sudden I walk in. It was a table just like this, and um, so there were five teachers on this side of the table, and um, like on, a, on this side, the other side of the table was a counselor and a social worker and a mom and a dad and the kid. And the kid was one of those kids that, uh, as a parent, you would love to have this kind of a kid. You just life was precious, and I taught uh, every moment was a gift to humanity. And this kid was. Just, are there any questions? His hand always goes up. Are there, stick around after class if you have, want to embellish. He was always that kid. He w I started class in those days at 7.25 in the morning, and the class was called Global Problems. Senior in high school, 7.25 in the morning, studying Armageddon naughty here. That's a joke. But it was all <laughs> about stuff like global, or at that time, global warming and nuclear holocaust. And it was just a buzzkill of a class. Well, <laughs> so this kid... Smile on his face every single day. Hi, Mr. Swadzinski. Some days leaving, um, saying, um, hey, thanks for teaching that. I didn't know anything about that. You know, just that kind of a kid. And so this, I'm sitting in this meeting, and he's sitting right across from me. He's got a big smile on his face. And the doctor thanks the t teachers for coming in. And he, the, um, and he, the doctor says, this young man has this 30-syllable word. And every day he wakes up, he has less and less eye vision. And someday, next week, next month, next year, he's going to wake up and be totally blind. Right. And I hope you're listening to this. You know who you are. And um, but one, but so what we'd like to ask you, teachers, is your, what advice would you give to the family? Um, and here's our question: Would you recommend using Braille on a seeing eye dog while you can still see, or would you wait until after you're blind to learn to use Braille on a seeing eye dog? So they, they, each teacher gave their wisdom and advice and their nuggets of, of pedagogical, pedagogical skills on what to do. And they get to me, and I laughed. I had no idea what to say. Because here's this kid with a huge smile on his face. Like, here's the hand I got dealt, Mr. Swartzinski. How would you play this hand? And so I'm just watching him, and, like, I'm thinking about any other human being would be bummed out and crying and despondent. And here he was, just this joy to life. And so... Anyway, so they get to me and I laugh, and finally 
okay, thank you, teachers, for coming in. We'll process what you said. And this guy at the end, what's your name, Swadzinski? You, where, why did you show? Anyways, so we're walking out in the hall. And the only teacher I remember there, um, she knows who she is, but um, she comes up to me and, and she says, Swad, that was really, you, you were an embarrassment in there. You, you, you know. And I said, are you kidding me? I had students this week who were suicidal because they weren't asked to prom. I have students this week who kick in school lockers because the comm doesn't work. I have students this week that drop the vulgarities because they didn't like something I said in class. And here he is with a smile on his face and be blind tomorrow. And they're asking me for my advice. This kid should be giving pep assemblies and, and pep talks to, this, to everybody about how to live. And she goes, go on and tell the parents that and I go you're right so I walked back in I told the parents that and um and I just said your your son is ama-. and so the next morning again first kid in the door he walks up to, right to my podium I'll never forget it's like it happened an hour ago and he walks up and he says you know Mr. Swadzin so I just want to thank you for what you said yesterday at that meeting my parents floated out the building they were so proud of me and I looked at him um and I never forget I said that meeting for me was a real eye-opener and as oh. soon as I, yeah, right. As soon as yeah. I said it, I went, oh, my God, faux pas, my yeah. picture in the dick. And he goes, no, that's a funny line. I'm going to start using that. And um, then he said, I'll never forget till the day I die. He said, what should I go see? What do you tell a high school senior what they should see when it might be their very moment might be his last day in class, um, yeah. last day of sun? Yeah, right. And um, wow. And so um, he might be the kid that had the best vision I've ever had in my career. Yeah. Um, just a breath of fresh air. And I ended up having his nephews. Wow. What so, an inspiration. Oh, yeah. God. I could go on. for. I, I'm Honestly, I had a... Um, uh, I, 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 I had this little person in class. Um, I don't know if she was four feet tall. And she just loved life. Just every moment she just breathed like, wow, isn't everything wonderful? And um, and she, she used to bring me a 12-pack of throwback Mountain Dew. I don't, I don't even know how she carried it into the building. And, um, and I'll just never forget one day um, I used to tell my students um, – that um, when we talked about John F. Kennedy, that my grandma and grandfather, immigrants to America, um, fleeing communism, anti-Semitism, tyranny, all that stuff, you know, at sure. the turn of the century. And so they fled and came here, and they gave their five-year-old grandson a milk glass, and on the milk glass was an image of John F. Kennedy on the back were the words, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And so they gave me this milk glass, and I'm, I'm telling the kids, you know, they gave me this milk glass, and, um, and so she raises her hand, and just this breath of fresh air, and she says, um, Mr. Swadzinski, do you still have the milk glass? And I go, no, that disappeared to the ash heap of history. And she goes, well, why don't you look on eBay? I didn't know what it was. I didn't know. I'd never bought anything on eBay. eBay yeah. And I go, well, what's that? And I, you know, I kind of knew what it was, but what's that? And she goes, I'll come by after school and I'll show you how to buy something on eBay. And she came and she found it. Wow. She found my grand, I mean, wow. you know, the, the yeah. blue glass. I mean, it was, I started crying. Wow. Was, I mean, she had, she, and then. So you have to buy it back? Do you have to buy it back? Yeah. Um, shipping was more expensive than the glass. <laughs> okay. And it's hanging in, I mean, it's on, it's on the shelf in my office at the Minnesota State Senate. It's That's neat. Yeah, and if any of you um, listeners know um, Citizen Kane, she helped me find my rosebud. Oh, um, sure. That's, I mean, That's awesome. This, yeah, and honest to God, Rick, I could, I don't know, I could probably talk for three hours about all the, I had 12,000 students, and so many had amazing impacts on my teaching career. No, that's awesome. That's inspirational. I think, you know, other teachers out there take inspiration from that and, you know, should be um, recognized as well. No, that's awesome. And then you um, get this foolhardy idea to run for political office. What, what what sparked that? How did that come about? What what you know? I've known you since you know you've you've run and, and been a senator. So what led to that? I taught for thirty three. Well, well, that it was my um, last year of teaching, and um, I started the year with one hundred and seventy two buttons. I made one hundred and seventy two buttons, and so uh, a gentleman at the CMS 
um, helped me make 100, 172, 171, 170, 160, all these buttons. And every day, my last year of teaching, I wore that day's button. How many days were left? Were left. And I wasn't counting the days to get out of here. I wanted a daily reminder that I've only got 143 days left of this incredible place, or 133. And every day I would look in the, around and give it that day's button to the kid that made the greatest impact upon the planet Earth. Oh, you know? And so I'd write on the back, thank you for your civic virtue and political efficacy. So I started my last year with doing that, and I blogged it. And anybody who knows me knows that's huge that I blogged anything. It's the only thing I've ever blogged, if that's even proper use of the, sure. <laughs> the adjective or noun. Don't listen, English teachers. Um, and so, and then in about December, I had no idea, no plans on what to do after. You know, I just was going through my last year of teaching and loving every minute of it. And, um, and some of the things I gave those buttons out for, um, you know, I'm sorry. So this kid is... Um, it's the first day of class, and so I don't know anybody, and this kid, right when the bell rings, walks over to the trash can and starts puking. And he's got his you know, head into the, into the trash can. And all of a sudden, I'm keeping the next class, because the bell had rung, I'm keeping the next class in the hallway, and this student is rubbing his back while he's throwing up in the trash can. And so I'm keeping the kids in the hall, I call the nurse, blah, blah, blah. So finally the nurse comes, takes the kids away, and this girl goes and starts picking up her materials and I said so how long have you two been dating she goes I've never met him till today I mean just helping somebody th- right else. and helping that's somebody what else. I would look yeah. for in that last day of teaching of yeah. all those so anyways December comes and um the, the some people in the um Democratic Party um who I had in class a sure. long time ago right um I happened to run in at a place and they found out I was retiring, and he goes, um, so what are you going to do after you retire? And I said, I don't really know yet. And she goes, let's go have coffee. So the two of us went and had coffee, and he talked to me about maybe running for state senate. And uh, I said, um, I'll go home and ask my wife and, and see what she thinks. And, uh, and we talked, and around December 15th, um, I decided, to, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this. And so I ran, or... Announced I was running. You announced so you were running, then you yeah. ran, and then you won? I did. It was um, among the highlights of my life. That Rick, so I, I'm eternally grateful to, to so many people. I, uh, to pe- I, I don't even know where to begin, but a lot of people worked really. It's a lot of work to run a campaign. So whether you're Republican or Democrat um, listener, um, thank you for all of your efforts on behalf of your party. It's, it's a lot of work. Well, one thing I think, too, is, is what you did. And, and again, so as a city manager, um, I'm not political. I don't get involved in any political activity, nor can I in any way, shape, or form. But you just you know see coverage of, of political races, and I think you had a lot of young people, a lot of social media, a lot of activism out there. So I think that probably is one thing that you would say kind of a grassroots effort, right? Yeah. That, that you had? Yeah. Um, there was a lot of young people coming coming back from school. I had one girl come um, from Chicago and slept in her car. She drove up on Friday and then slept in her car to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And you told her you would have hitchhiked. I, I didn't you think that. You would have hitchhiked, that. but yeah. she drove. She no, that's drove. pretty neat. Yeah. That's pretty neat. I know that there's a lot of passion for that. So... You're what now? Uh, two years in. This is the start of our third session. Third, third, third session. Yeah. So yeah, you're elected for four years, and so you're kind of halfway through, mm-hmm. halfway through your first term. So, talk a little bit about those first couple of years. Oh, what God. was that like? Um, you know, it's funny because all anybody ever says it's like drinking through a water, a fire hose. Fire hose. And I'd never heard that phrase in my life. And then I heard it a thousand times <laughs> within the first couple months. The the learning curve is, um, it, I don't even know. I don't know what else to compare it with because my whole world was teaching, and um, so. But I will say, um, no job is harder than teaching uh, that I'm aware of. Um, teaching is a, is a very um, it's the most noble of professions, and those people work so hard. But I digress. Um, but it's it's just learning. I'd never hired anybody in my life. I mean, teachers don't hire. I mean, I've never hired anybody, so I had to hire a legislative assistant. And so just everything and getting an office. I'd never had an office in my life. I've never had a uh, secretary, so to speak, in my life. Um, 
So it was just a lot. Just the logistics. Those, those yeah, simple just logistics. all that stuff. Logistics of yeah. going up there. Because you, obviously, you followed issues and mm. passionate about education. And I know, you know, the different committees you're on, education and, and veterans affairs and a lot of those issues. But yet, at the same time, it's just the everyday logistics of hiring people and, and yeah. going to meetings, right, yeah. and meeting new and the, people. And everything's great. Everything down there, um, the, the two things, I never thought I'd find anything I love more than teaching, but th- this could be better than teaching because I can go potty. When, I don't have to wait for a bell to ring <laughs> okay. to go potty. Right. And, um, and, and honest to God, Rick, every single person that comes into my office wants to educate me. And unlike college, this time I want to learn everything because it's so interesting. Just everybody that comes to that office to meet with me, constituents, lobbyists, ex-students. I had an ex-student swing by yesterday. Um, and it's just really, really cool. Um, so do you So do you have, though, and that, that's awesome, but yeah. do you still have when someone's educating you, they, there might be two people on the opposite ends yeah. of an issue. They each want to educate you, and they're in different places. So is that kind of this difficult balance? It of, is. But um, part of my teaching career, and that's what makes my job hard, is I tend to see two sides to every issue. But that was 33 good. years of brainstorming. Um, on the first day of class, for 33 years, the kids had to take a test. And then the second day, um, based on their test results, the liberals sat on the left side of my room and the Republicans sat on the right. So, And then for the next eight, nine weeks or however long the course was, we debated the two sides. And then we as a group try to reach a conclusion. And now when I just have one side come into my office, it's um, there's a, a, another side to the story. Yeah. And you always try to seek that out. And um, That's yeah. good. That's yeah. good. So when you look at the, the first two years, mm. what, what would be some of the accomplishments that you, you know, whether it's some legislation that was passed or some stuff that you personally worked on? Yeah. Or, or Being you, a freshman in the minority, it's, tough. it's, it's tougher. Yeah. Um, but I think we got some – I mean, I was part of trying to get some things done, you know. And I know some of my – I'm not taking credit for this because it takes, you know, a lot of people's effort. But we got Sunday liquor sales through. We've got um, the railroad, um, the, the pass, the uh, sure. student passage by the high yeah, school. The kind of city all school. Those years. Right. Yeah, that Thank finally, you for that. Yeah, well, it, um, all representatives from Eden Prairie had a huge hand in that. So I would um, thank them as well. Um, so there's little things like that that um, – really Real ID, um, making sure education funding is trying to keep up, get caught up to where it once was. Uh, so we're just, uh, but I think for me, it's the first couple of years was all about building relationships on both sides of the aisle and trying to to get to know everybody so that I can get go seek people out when I have questions and feel comfortable meeting them. Um, and then you, you know, and so you have a four-year horizon. I think that yeah. the House members, it's like every two years, every two years. Yeah. That's that's a tough gig. But you're able to kind of, similar to maybe a mayor or city council member, spend a year kind of building relationships, learning issues, and, and you know, you've got those four years to, to dig in. But you're all of Eden Prairie and a chunk of Minnetonka as well. Yeah. So, You've gotten to know the community, I think, over time here. Yeah, and the part of Eden Prairie I don't have is by Bryant Lake. That's a small piece. You do have that small piece that's in uh, Senator Franzen's district. That's right. Senator I don't Melissa have Fra- that. You don't have no, that. No, yeah, I don't Melissa have Melissa Franzen that. has that. Correct. So and she has that small chunk. Yeah, so, it's so I'm about 90%, 90% of Eden Prairie. That's true. I think that's in the Hopkins School District, too. It might be. It may be. It may be. So what do you see coming up? I want to ask – in a little oh. bit I want to ask about you personally again, kind of um, – kind of what what you like to do when you're not legislating but what do you see coming up 2019 um, um i had a town hall for, forum last week last saturday and we had 200 people show up and it was great and i wish i could say well the issues are different this year this is great we got solved <laughs> the issues of last year now there's some new <laughs> issues coming up and unfortunately well the only one that solved is southwest light rail so that has no one has brought that to my attention sure. um it's construction time now. it's construction time and i think i'm very excited about having that um completion in 2023 but the issues um gun Violence and um, opioid addiction and mental health. There's just those three things just rise to the top every time uh, you meet with with anybody, and it's just sad. And uh, another thing, I could just go on and on and on. I am shocked at how many students of mine have died because of those three causes. 
over the last couple of years that teachers never hear about because they die when they're 19, 20, 21, 22. Yeah. And so because they're not in your class, you never hear about what happens after they graduate. Right. And um, it's really, really disturbing to us. And if you had any idea, and I wish more teachers that would find out about this because it's, um, it, it, I think we got a problem. Our kids yeah. are screaming for help. Um, and it's that those issues, like when I was a kid, you didn't talk about cancer. You know, if Auntie M right. had breast cancer, you didn't talk about it. And I think right now the social stigma between um, when your family's struggling with mental health or opioid addiction, it's, it's really tragic. Yeah, I think I had the, our former police chief, you know, in here, and he talked about that as well. And just this sadness when, you know, you go through the obituaries and you see all these young people and it doesn't talk about a cause of death, but you have kind of that that sad feeling about what that may be about it's it's a crisis no doubt about it so city state nationally it's something that i think we're all we need to work on yeah yeah no you're exactly right so what what uh what else outside of legislating and you're being a retired teacher what how do you what else do you do to have fun uh well one of the surprises of being a state senator uh, I, I, as a teacher, I knew on September 1st what my calendar looked like for the next nine months. I mean, you just knew. You were right. done at 3.30, and then you, except for those four nights you had conferences. And this job is so unpredictable. I don't know what my schedule looks like tomorrow. Uh, there's 13 and 14 hour days. I had last week out of the four nights of the week, I left before seven all four mornings, and I didn't get home till after nine o'clock. It's just different, but it's all awesome. It's un- but you're right. It's unpredictable. And as you get deeper into the session, yeah. and what is that kind of in that April May time frame? It could be all day, all night. Yeah. So you just really what you're saying is you can't really plan to do anything right. else for the first six months of the year. Yeah, but you get some time in the summer. Yeah, and you get week general. Well, and it's all weekends, good stuff weekends. though. It's yeah. like it's not like it's a hassle or work or not. Where I shouldn't have said it because of course it's work. But um, so what I like to do, I um, I love the Boundary Waters. I've been I missed one year since 1979 of going to the Boundary Waters. And it was in 2016 when my campaign manager said, not this year. <laughs> and it killed me. It yeah. really did. Um, I don't know, something just spiritually or mentally or some chi thing. You need, I, you need to recharge. I you do. need to get back there. And so my wife and I have been going up there together since about 83 um, and never missed a summer except awesome. 2016. So the Boundary Waters is pretty important to me and, and camping. And, I, and I, I, I love traveling and seeing the world. I took... Um, um, about eight or ten stu- trips to, to Europe, Eastern Europe, um, Auschwitz um, a couple times, and Israel a few times. And I took students for 20 years to Washington, D.C. And what I tried to do on those trips is instill in kids that sense of wanderlust. The kids today, I would say this to anybody, they're, they're less sexist, they're less homophobic, they're less racist than we were when we were in school. Um, they're just better people. I really, I, I would, you know, I really have faith in the youth. But the one thing that I find um, discouraging is they don't seem to have that sense of wanderlust. Um, I, I wish more kids had a um, what's on the other side of that hill. And I don't know what what we did, we as the grown ups. Um, but um, nonetheless, um, I'd focus on their strengths rather than their weaknesses because their strengths far outweigh their weaknesses. But that's the one thing. And so maybe, I don't know, maybe that's somehow connected with this whole this mental health and opioid addiction crisis is they're not going to the boundary waters. Well, that's, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, the, how everything's scheduled and the level of stress and the technology of today, everything now, every information now, this is a chance to unplug, right? The ability to unplug and not think too much. You're probably right. I think, yeah, yeah, maybe. But we're I don't not know about here the to No, we can't, we can't solve yeah. all. It's all. Well, you'll be able to solve some yeah. of this. But, <laughs> but I, you know, I appreciate you coming in. Yeah. Steve, it's great. Um, You're great, Rick. No, Stevie. We could, we could Mutual li- Admiration Society. Okay, thank you. But I, I appreciate you coming in, uh, talking a little bit about um, yourself and your history, and I hope you have a, a great uh, legislative session this year. I'm um, One final thought? Absolutely. Um, I, I'm so optimistic. Um, to the listener out there, I'm not sure if you're aware, there's um, 50 bicameral legislatures in the United States. One's in Washington and then 49 state capitals. Nebraska's the only unicameral legislature. 
Washington, D.C. right now is in gridlock and, um, and having a hard time with the shutdown because, um, not because of, but what may be because of, um, the Senate is controlled by the Republicans and the House is controlled by the Democrats. We in St. Paul are the only divided legislature in the country besides Washington, D.C. The rest, one party controls both branches. And I think he, um, what I'm really excited about over the next four or five months is I think we have the opportunity to send Washington, D.C. and the state and and the country and the world um, a message that maybe we in Minnesota can get things right and we can work across the aisle and move the state forward and leave the world a better place than we found it. And I really am optimistic about that we can get that done. And so that's what I'm hopeful for. That's great to hear. Well, thanks, Steve. Yeah. Good to see you. Okay. Thanks, Rick. Yep. Bye. Bye.